pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Christian Steidel, Director of the Center for Lymphoid Cancer at the British Columbia Cancer Agency. Christian? Thank you very much. Can you? Yeah, yeah I think I, I hear it now. Well, um, I'm, I'm happy to be here again and um, um, give a couple updates um, from, from our uh, project on single cell transcriptome analysis in Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, disclosures here shouldn't be too relevant for what, um, what I'm talking about. So to, to warm up now to um, a disease-specific talk, and I, I, I'm really <laughs> impressed with the, the breadth of, of talks that I heard, very stimulating. Um, so, so my talk will be in a, in a fairly narrowly defined disease context, which is which is Hodgkin lymphoma, and to, to warm uh, everyone uh, up, up to that, that topic. So maybe a little bit of history. So the, the recognition of um, the, the histology of Hodgkin lymphoma um, came, came uh, quite, quite early um, with, with the invention of, uh, of microscopes. Um, so here, um, Dorothy uh, Reed Mendenhall uh, describing um, the morphology of, of Reed Sternberg cells, and, and he, an example here on the right. But, but what, what really um, d drives the classification still today uh, of Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma is, is the, the tumor microenvironment of uh, cells. In other words, um, a readout of, of an entire ecosystem of cells, um, not, not only um, the description of, of malignant cell uh, properties. Quite, quite apparent, um, so apparent actually that we're, we are still sticking to nomenclature. That is, that is mostly driven by microenvironment features, as, as shown in, in Hodgkin lymphoma. As, as you know also, um, Paul Allen's first lymphoma diagnosis was a Hodgkin lymphoma in, in 90, uh, 1982, I believe, so that's, I was seven years old maybe, so it, it, it tells that it's curable or that you can have long-term um, remissions with lymphomas. But, but really the, the translational um, question and the clinical question is: We, we have to we have to broaden our success, and we we um, have to specifically look into high risk uh, lymphoma populations, um, and and specifically relapse and resistance mechanisms. So to drill a little bit deeper into the cellular ecosystem, as as seen in in Hodgkin lymphoma, and and you can actually take Hodgkin lymphoma as a teacher for for other lymphomas, but also for other cancers, um, because it's very unique in its property that the malignant cells are only a percent or so. It can vary a little bit, but the, the bulk of the, um, the, the tumor is actually a, a microenvironment. And figuring out what's going on in terms of composition, function, cellular crosstalk is, is a really rich playground and, and lessons to be learned for, for other cancers. So this is how it looks. Um, with standard histology, um, you see fumbling around here. Um, so you can you can see the malignant cells here, and then a um, quite abundant microenvironment. And with standard technology, it's it's, it's obviously very tough to to figure out what uh, what the immune cell subsets might be. Um, this is uh, currently more in a standard fashion uh, done with. Um, immunostochemistry approaches, flow cytometry, and we have, to, we have to upgrade the system. So currently microenvironment composition is important um, because we define subtypes by, by this composition. We, we have prognostic information for standard of care therapy, and also with emerging immunotherapy, we have predictive biomarkers or emerging predictive biomarkers available that, for example, would, um, would, would suggest better or worse response for, for example, um, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So a little um, cartoon here um, to f flesh out that point a little bit more. Um, what, what are current approaches that, that are, are not solely targeting uh, malignant cell um, properties, but work in the interface of malignant cells in the ecosystem with the tumor microenvironment? And a couple of examples are here, the, check, the PD-1 blockade um, checkpoint inhibitor type therapies. Um, <clears throat> we have we have CAR T cell approaches, we have NK cell engages by specific antibodies, uh, just to name a few. So um, the, 
the best example of, of effective immunotherapy um, would be the, the PD-1 blockade, and, and just to, um, to, to make that point very clear again, so with melanoma and Hodgkin lymphoma, these are the outlier positive objective response rates that have been obser observed, and it's, it's quite intuitive um, to, to think about this success in the context of Hodgkin lymphoma because there is something to be disrupted in terms of crosstalk with microenvironment biology. So that's, there's obviously much more detail to that, but um, th that's, that's one explanation um, wh why they might work preferentially. So very, very briefly, um, the, the state of the art here, um, what, what we are currently using for a, a deeper interrogation of microenvironment-related phenotypes, um, studies from various groups, uh, including um, here from, from Boston, using uh, mass cytometry um, to, to read out the tumor microenvironment, um, a, a study published last year, um, followed up by, by um, more work um, coming, coming out um, from, from our group and uh, other groups. Um, so so what, what we now in the context of um, <clears throat> the, the Allen Frontiers Group um, funded program, what, what we are now doing is um, at attempting to, um, to have an even deep, deeper dive into this biology through uh, single cell RNA sequencing and adding the, the spatial layer on top of those data via imaging mass cytometry, which is in essence um, what the, um, the, the program is funded for. So I, I want to mention that the, the Center for Lymphoid Cancer in Vancouver um, has, a, um, has a, a system set up, a provincial system in British Columbia set up that, um, that has a population base to draw from. So our material banks and um, our um, centralized um, pathology review system allows us to, um, to, to drill into specific lymphoma subsets um, that's, that are uh, truly based on the population of um, British Columbia, so that we have hundreds of, um, of histology-defined samples with um, very, very deep metadata to, uh, to run transcriptional programs and, and deep phenotypic profiling. So here um, you see the, the goals of uh, the study to decipher the crosstalk, as, as mentioned. Um, we, we do want to define the targetable biology in the context of modern immunotherapies, and we want to provide predictive biomarkers um, to, to tailor our treatments more to, uh, to the individual patient's properties. And um, we have three aims. Um, one, to, to look into the properties of the malignant cells. At the same time, for the same samples, also understand the, um, the composition and, and functionality of the tumor microenvironment read out by single-cell RNA-seq and imaging mass cytometry, and then um, translate that into, into routine applicable uh, cl clinical platforms um, to, to, to migrate that to the clinic. So we, we have now uh, produced um, our, our first um, more or less complete data set in the first year. Um, 22 um, Hodgkin, classical Hodgkin lymphoma patients have been have been included in the study, so we get a, a good mix of, um, of mixed cellularity and nodular sclerosis subtypes, which are subtypes of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So we have EBV association and EBV negative status um, as, as well here, which is the framework for then um, further uh, correlative analyses based on um, what we are finding. So we have used the 10x genomics platform for this. Um, and um, what you can see here is a breakdown into um, 13, uh, excuse me, 23 um, unsupervised uh, cluster or clusters that came out of unsupervised analysis um, with um, representation of, of multiple B cell, T cell, and um, macro, macrophage and uh, dendritic cell clusters. And um, if you uh, look at, at the same data in Tisney space, um, you can define an immune cell atlas of Hodgkin lymphoma that is, that is shown here with all these um, subdivisions being, being represented by um, previously recognized T cell subsets um, in, in, in normal and on, on malignant um, um, biology. And what is, what is now um, really the take home message here from this slide is that we that we can contrast the picture in classical Hodgkin lymphoma as compared to reactive lymph nodes. Um, and you see those two islands that are heavily enriched 
in uh, Hodgkin lymphoma and can therefore be seen as Hodgkin lymphoma um, typic. Um, if you map that back, the, these are T regulatory cells and TH17 cells that come out as, as the most exciting um, clusters to follow up on. Um, seen, seen a little bit differently um, here, on the left would be the clusters that are heavily enriched in the Hodgkin lymphoma, and on the right, the, the, the clusters that are heavily enriched in the reactive lymph node specimens. And just to focus on one example here, most to the left is a, um, a T-Rex, we call it C5 cluster, that is characterized by co-expression of LAC3 and CTLA4, so these would be classic um, markers for an immunosuppressive or regulatory um, T-cell subset. Um, you can read off all the other markers that go along. Really, this is when the um, single cell data starts to shine because you really have, have a really, really deep interrogation into, um, into multiple markers um, that, that then go deeper um, than classical flow cytometry or mass cytometry approaches. Um, if, if we now um, look deeper into the LAC3 expression um, pattern, you um, can appreciate here <clears throat> that we can, in in vitro system, we can induce the LAC3 expression by supernatant transfer from Hodgkin lymphoma lines, but not um, from diffuse large B cell lymphoma lines, for example. So what you see here is naive T cells that um, have inducible LAC, LAC3 expression um, through the cytokine milieu um, as, as uh, presented in, in Hodgkin lymphoma um, cultures. So there's a couple of, of very li likely um, in interleukins or cytokines that might be at play here, and I, I can't go into more detail, but um, interleukin-6, for example, would be one of the, um, the, the more exciting candidates. So um, the, uh, these LAC3 positive cells have also other hallmarks of, of um, an immunosuppressive um, uh, subset. Um, for example, for example, interleukin-10 um, TGF-beta expression, which is pulled out directly from the 10x data, but we can also in our model system um, characterize the LAC3 positive cells versus the LAC3 negative cells, and you see here a clear difference in interleukin-10 uh, and TGF-beta expression. So um, what everyone um, immediately asks uh, to these data, including ourselves, and, and when we discuss, well, what about, what about the, um, the, the other T cell markers that everyone talks about um, that are very relevant in the context of um, immune checkpoints? Um, TIGID, um, LAC3, TIM3, um, PD-1, because of, of the, the druggable target here. And the take home message here is um, these patterns are, are not all happening in the, in the same um, t, t cell um, subset. So there's a diverse portfolio of T cells, and um, the, the expression um, is, um, is a little bit of a patchwork. So you see, for example, here that in the, in the LAC3 um, positive, we, we call them T regs um, for now, so that, we, that we have, um, for example, no PD1 expression, um, no TIGIT expression, and that FOXP3 and, and LAC3 um, would, would go together. Um, so you, you have um, cytotoxic T cells here, for example, that, um, that have a little bit of PD-1, but the PD-1 really resides mostly in the CD4 positive um, uh, non-TREC population. So a really granular account and um, lots to be cleaned up and made, made sense of also from a, from a targetability point of view if you think about the various checkpoint inhibitors that are out there and which T cell they really target. So, um, <clears throat> so you know, for, for us focusing on on um, the LAC3, we were obviously interested in the, the LAC3, what are the, the most uh, common co-expressed partners. So, so here the take home message is that it's, it's either, it's mostly CTLA4 that would um, go together with the LAC3 and that's the bulk of the cells that we, that we see in Hodgkin lymphoma biopsies. So um, this, this combination of LAC3 positivity and FOXP3 positivity is, is, is not a cell type that has never been seen before. Um, so it, it is a T-cell subset um, that um, is pretty much in line with a, um, an inducible um, a, a regular, a, or type 1 regulatory T-cell, TR1 cell, um, that, that um, is, is, seems to be very, very abundant in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And what a very very important translational point here is that it's, it's rather mutually exclusive um, to FOXP3 positive cells. And if you think about um, the, the standard readout of regulatory cells 
um, used um, in, in model systems, um, mouse, but also very importantly as a biomarker in clinical studies. Most of these studies um, use exclusively FOXP3, but what you can see here is um, the, um, the size of the T cells with suppressive function that you're missing by staining single stain FOXP3 with just minimal overlap. So, um, very important message for, um, for, for histology interrogation of tumor microenvironments. So um, to, to make that um, po point um, here again, you see all those, uh, those markers here that would have um, LAC3 and FOXP3 um, and, and only a, a minor proportion uh, that is FOXP3. So we next looked into the spatial relationship um, of these LAC3 positive cells in, in relation to um, the malignant hodgkin reed sternberg cells, and we immediately saw that, um, that these um, so-called rosettes um, are sometimes um, positive um, for, um, for, for the LAC3, and it can, can happen in the surrounded way or in, in a scattered way. So here, this would be pretty much in line with an induced phenotype so that the HRS cells produce um, a milieu that um, has a regional effect in the direct vicinity. Um, and um, we um, quite strikingly and, and um, quite surprisingly, actually, we saw that um, this, this abundance and the resetting of uh, those cells is linked to a feature of the malignant cells. So we, we have a link of MHC class two loss of expression on malignant cells to the abundance of um, this subset. So a very nice example how likely a, a, a genetic event or a phenotypic characterization of the malignant cells goes along with a spatial pattern in the tumor microenvironment. And um, just to contrast that to other parameters here that are not linked, so it's a very specific MHC class two status um, linked to, to our finding. And um, that's exactly why we have set up the, the imaging mass cytometry um, collaboration with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Merchant at uh, Cedar sinai who is also a co-investigator on, on the um, investigator um, award. Um, so we, we have large repositories of uh, tissue microarrays that are a perfect match for this technology because you can, you can uh, deploy that technology on all the cores on a tissue microarray with um, highly annotated metadata in, in our Hodgkin lymphoma um, uh, materials. And you see here that we can easily um, reconstruct this finding that in MHC class two negative um, Hodgkin lymphoma, we have rosetting with these LAC3 positive cells, whereas in MHC class two positive, we have an abundance of FOXP3, and recall that we had this mutually exclusive pattern, either LAC3 high or FOXP3 high, and this is also spatially resolved um, that uh, here we, we don't have any LAC3 cells in the vicinity, but, but mostly um, FOXP3. So a very nice example, we are quite excited about this. So we can, um, we can also quantify that. Um, by, by measuring nearest neighbors, um, sa same result here, that HRS cells are in closer vicinity if, if they are MHC negative. So how does that now come back to, to a model and how might that be relevant for uh, treating Hodgkin lymphoma? So um, we believe that there is a, a, po a polarizing um, or two types of, of microenvironments, type one here, with uh, loss of MHC class two and high LAC3 as an, in an induced phenotype in a, a T cell subset. So um, we call this mediated immunosuppression. Some factors from the HRS cells that induce um, th these cells to do, the dirty to do the dirty work for the malignant cells to add immunosuppressive function through, for example, IL-10 and TGF-beta. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have an an, an inflammatory phenotype with still intact antigen presentation, uh, macrophages, cytotoxic T cells, interferon gamma, inflammatory milieu. However, those um, HRS cells don't seem to be too harmed by this, but rather thrive on the inflammatory um, response back to the HRS cells 
um, to, to outpace the immune surveillance um, process. So how does that relate to, to drug targets? So here we would have um, PD-1 positive T cells in the microenvironment. Um, here we would not. Here we would have rather CTLA-4 and LAC-3. And um, as we have matching antibodies to LAC-3, uh, ipilimumab here or nivolumab, pembrolizumab on that um, side, we, we think that this uh, can be the start of a, a microenvironment microenvironment-based nomenclature that would, um, that would suggest um, which immunotherapies might work best. You could argue that usually clinical trials just storm ahead and combinations are, are used empirically without knowing any of the biology, but still uh, I think it would be timely to, to figure out um, how these microenvironments um, relate, relate to, to response so that we can, in a, in a more um, t targeted way, de deploy our, our tools. So um, this um, theory is nicely validated by, um, um, by work from, from the, the SHIP um, group here uh, at Dana-Farber, where MHC class 2 um, absence or presence would actually predict um, the response to, to nivolumab, and if I just uh, pull you back to, to, to this scenario, that this would be exactly what we see in this scenario, where PD-1 blockade would work with active MHC or um, present MHC class 2, whereas we would predict that it doesn't work that well on the left-hand side. So with that, I want to conclude um, that we have um, a, a very interesting and exciting uh, population of CTLA-4 LAC3 like positive T cells. Um, we um, have um, a phenotype that is consistent with TR1. Um, we have uh, clinical trials that c currently explore all these approaches, including a LAC3 um, targeting approach. And um, from a biomarker point of view, the microenvironment profiling might be the way to go. Um, quick acknowledgments here. Um, large team of, of graduate students, postdocs, and colleagues who have been working on um, computational aspects, uh, the pathology aspects, the, the clinical annotations, and um, also Tomo, Tomohiro Aoki, who is, who is driving the entire project. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge my, my collaborator, Akhil Marchand, again, who, um, who is instrumental for, for the spatial um, analysis. With that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>